Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters here on France 24. I'm Delano D'Souza, coming up on the show this week. France 24 reporters gain rare access to Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. We'll be showing you how one hospital in the city of Sada can barely cope. Israel shifts its strategy and announces once again it's conducted airstrikes on Iranian positions in Syria. Benjamin Netanyahu accusing Syrian forces of being tools of Iranian aggression. And in our Flavors of Iraq series, we'll be telling you how the first Gulf War left its mark on a 10-year-old child. But first, we head to the Yemeni city of Sada, controlled by Houthi rebels. It's seen some of the worst battles since fighting broke out between the Iran-backed Houthis and the Saudi-led coalition in 2014. For civilians in Sada, life has become hell on earth. A warning that some of the images in this next report may be disturbing for some. Sada. Just a few kilometers from the Saudi border, the historic bastion of the Houthi rebellion. This city has known its fair share of conflicts over the centuries, but the most recent one has all but destroyed it. The little local hospital is overwhelmed with injured, civilians and fighters who are not allowed to see. The Houthi fighters keep close control of their image and rarely grant access to their strongholds. But they will take us to the children's emergency room. Miners are on the front line of this conflict. One in four of them suffers from malnutrition. It's because of the endless fighting and its economic impact that we see cases like these. If we had enough medication and resources, we wouldn't be facing this health crisis. We've been here for nine days. Her health has just got worse. We've tried everything, but we're losing hope. This pediatric unit is one of the last still going in the high plateau of northern Yemen, where hospitals and clinics have been destroyed in air raids. Tell me what prevented you from coming earlier. The war, of course. It's not just the war, it's the embargo too. This is the third time we've seen this little one here. Where can we send him? To Sana, so he can be treated overseas? Obviously, that's not possible. There's no flights out of Sana. The reality is, we just don't have the means to save this child. It's over for him. This is the least visible but most devastating consequence of the war. A scarcity and lack of everything that will affect generations to come. To talk more about the report and filming in Yemen, we can bring in Cyril Payan, who filed that story for France 24. Now, Cyril, not many journalists uh, gain access to Yemen easily. How did you? Well, it's a very long process. We were able six months ago with Amar al midawi to, to go into southern Yemen, which is controlled by the government forces, the loyalists, which are the arch enemies, the brother enemies of the Otis. This time was quite different and radically more difficult, actually, because we have, when you try to get in this part of Yemen, northern Yemen, uh, you face the, the complexity of the civil war. So you just actually land in the south, which is not controlled by the Houthis, and then you have to go through the front lines up north, and then uh, getting in touch with the Houthis. This is what we did for 15 days, under very difficult conditions, because the, the Houthis are not very um, welcoming the outside world. It is very rare to get access to their strongholds in the north, and they were restricting on the daily basis, all what we wanted to do or all we wanted to, to film. So you weren't able to go around by yourself without an escort, I'd imagine? They were, we were escorted from the very first day until the last day when we crossed back the, the front line and they were talking to every people we were talking to, taking names and just monitoring what we actually were doing on the field. Now, why did the, in this report which you filmed, you filmed a children's hospital. Why did you only gain access to a children's hospital? It's also the very big question of uh, whether we show first these faces, which is a very questionable thing to do to broadcast because it's very hard, but also are we the tools of the propaganda from the Houthis? Because when we have been able to get access to this small hospital in Sada, which is a stronghold of the Houthis, 
close to the Saudi border, close to the front line. Uh, uh, we, they didn't want us to film, as we said in the report, to uh, civilians wounded or injured military personnel from the Houthis. They just directed us to, the, to these kids because it was obvious that it was from, for them, from, for, for them what they wanted, what kind of footage or image they wanted to show to the outside world. So this is what we did. We decided to show the faces and to film them, these kids, because they actually exist. There are hundreds of kids like that because of the bombardments or the embargo, we just die from malnutrition and not to get access to any medication. Now, you've been to conflict zones around the world. What impression did you leave Yemen with? It's um, a waste because uh, very west of uh, uh, human uh, structure, of infrastructure. And uh, again, just to, to, to talk to the Yemeni, especially in northern Yemen, where they have heavy airstrikes every day, uh, the war is going on for four years, they know what's going on and they don't understand really much. 100% of them we have been talking to why the international community is not going to help, why we just have a very fragile ceasefire in some part of, uh, of Yemen and not the, the international community is not um, trying to put an end to this terrible war. Now, you travel to the flashpoint port city of Hodeida, where there is a ceasefire in place. Uh, do you, what's the prospect of peace throughout the country, in your opinion? Again, very sadly, there is no much of prospect of, uh, of, uh, of peace because uh, we, we just landed in, uh, for 24 hours in Odeida on the, the window on the Red Sea, which is a key to this war. Um, there should have been a ceasefire, but there were some airstrikes going on, some snipers at any corner of street. And again, the local people were not expecting any, any, uh, um, a, any deal or any peace uh, uh, for long term to be implemented there. Indeed, uh, Cyril, thank you very much for that. Cyril Payan there. Now, there's been a shift in strategy from Israel in recent weeks, the country openly admitting it's targeted Iranian positions in Syria. Israel clarified recently it's conducted hundreds of strikes over the years. The shift comes in the aftermath of Donald Trump's shock announcement that U.S. forces would be withdrawing from Syria. Israeli airstrikes on what the country's defense forces say are Iranian positions in Syria. That announcement in the early hours of Monday once again reiterating a shift in Israel's strategy regarding its war-torn neighbor. The strikes were in response to cross-border rocket fire. Amateur footage shows the moment an allegedly Iran-made missile is intercepted by Israel's missile defense system above a ski resort in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. On Monday, Israel's prime minister issued a blunt warning that acts of aggression from Iran, a close ally of the Syrian regime, won't go unnoticed. We are acting against Iran and against the Syrian forces who are tools of Iranian aggression. Whoever tries to hurt us, we will hurt them. Whoever threatens to destroy us will bear the full consequences. The Syrian government, however, is offering a different version of events. Our air defences confronted these jets and shot them all down. They're not targeting Iranians or any of our allies. They're targeting Syrian forces. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, 11 pro-regime fighters were killed in those Israeli airstrikes. Last week, Israel admitted to carrying out hundreds of attacks in Syria over the years. The timing of the announcement is significant, with Netanyahu looking to bolster his security credentials ahead of April elections. It also comes one month after President Donald Trump announced the imminent withdrawal of all U.S. troops from Syria, worrying the U.S.'s allies in the region. Time now for the next in our Flavors of Iraq series. Today we tell you about the first Gulf War, one of the first conflicts that played out on television screens around the world from the perspective of a 10-year-old boy. The summer of 1990 started on a high note. I was 10. My aunt Sumeya and my Iraqi cousins came to visit us in Argenteuil, in the suburbs of Paris. But the fun ended abruptly, on August 2nd to be exact. Hello. As of this morning, Iraq and Kuwait are at war. Saddam Hussein's army has entered the capital, fighting... Less than a year of peace and another war had already broken out. My aunt and her children returned home sooner than expected. They were afraid the country might close its borders. 
For seven months, Iraq occupied Kuwait. In January 1991, the international community retaliated. Voici maintenant un document pour l'histoire. C'était dans la nuit de mercredi à jeudi à Bagdad, la première vague de bombardements lancée par les Américains. My father, an exile dissident, was one of Saddam's political opponents. But that night, he was rooting for the Iraqi army. As the bombs rained down, there was no doubt he was thinking of his family. It was the first time I saw my father drunk. Give him hell, brothers. Soon, our screens were filled with images of the first Iraqi prisoners of war. My mother thought she recognized one of my cousins. The next day in the schoolyard, everyone was talking about the fireworks they saw on TV. I was the school's only Iraqi. Foolishly, I expected to be supported by my Arab brothers. The Americans really screwed you over. <laughs> I was in sixth grade. It was the first time I got into a fight for political reasons. That's it for this edition of the program. Don't forget, you can reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. That's Middle East Matters France 24. From all of us on the team, thank you very much for watching. From North America to the southern tip of Patagonia, join us for a look at the latest political, economic, cultural and social news from the Americas. Inside the Americas. Presented by Jeannie Godula on France 24 and France24.com.